Ray, I'm really excited to catch up with you here at Fuse and learn everything that Cohere is doing, but let's start with the universal spectrum multiplier. Maybe you can give us a bit of a high-level overview of the technology and tell us a little bit about the results you're seeing in your work with Vodafone and Bell Canada. Sure, Sean. Thanks for that opportunity. Great to see you here in Fuse in Ireland. Uh, so our universal spectrum multiplier, you can think of it as a layer two, layer three solution. I'll contrast that later in our discussion with the Pulse Zone, which is really a layer one solution. They both use the same technology. It's uh, grown out of the radar industry. It, it's uh, formed in the delay Doppler domain. Delay Doppler, as opposed to time frequency, they're related, but mathematically related, but they have special properties in the delay Doppler domain. What we do is we, we use that and we listen to reference symbols that are in the standard. So we're fully standards compliant with 4G or 5G. We will be standards compliant with 6G when that eventually comes about. Uh, we're fully standards compliant with Wi-Fi. So it's completely transparent to the radio layer, the physical layer. And what it does is it listens to those reference symbols. From that, it quickly discerns what the channel state is to every attached user. It does that by mapping the physical environment, the reflective environment. That's what drives channel state. And then it, it provides that channel state to the scheduler. So now when a base station schedules users, it already knows what the channel state is to every attached user. And when you know the channel state you schedule with perfect knowledge, you're not guessing anymore, and the performance is significantly better, including you're able to do MU-MIMO, both in a TDD and an FTD way, and dramatically improve the performance of a base station. Well, tell me a little bit about the go-to-market and the yeah. scalability of the solution. I think with Bell Canada, right, it's a standalone server connected over Ethernet to the G Node B, right? But how do you how do you really push this into market more broadly? So, that's a great question. So, backing up, we spent years doing it by ourselves on a Dell server with Intel as a partner and FlexRAN as their FI. Uh, we did that to prove that the performance of the USM was worthy of integration with the more mature players. We're now in that integration stage, and the first step is to put our box behind there and talk across the standard Ethernet and make sure that we can actually control each other's functions to our mutual advantage. There will likely be further integration of our functionality into the G Node B, whether that's an existing G Node B or next gen G Node B. You know, there's a lot of folks that are talking about moving and upgrading, a lot of announcements going on in the industry, so there's a lot of change. Um, Either way, it'll still provide the same function, whether it's residing in the base station or in a separate box. Now, the benefit of a separate box is that it can actually move to its rightful place in the network if the operators so choose. So this is a precursor to Cloud RAN because we've already inserted latency between our box and a third-party box to prove that our box would do the exact same thing if hosted in a data center. So now, when companies like NVIDIA decide to get into this category, there's a path to bring GPUs to the full edge under a tower and a base station. There's also a path to bring intelligence from the base station to where the GPUs are now in the data center. And um, you know, there's pros and cons to each. My guess is that there'll be a hybrid play. There'll be a very thin down GPU that's at the edge that does not only some AI at the edge, but actually controls some very, very latency sensitive applications, either ones today or ones that'll be invented but the vast majority of the data flows that can handle longer uh, latencies, conventional latencies that we have today, will easily be able to go round trip back and forth. And that's where a large data set uh, and a large version of our USM will exist in the cloud as well. And an important thing to remember is that a cellular network is interference limited by its nature. About half of the system interference is happening between users in the same cell. About half of the interference is happening between users in different cells. And until you bring that aperture of that USM into the cloud, you only see half the interference. You're only doing half the work you're asked to do. So there's a dramatic improvement in overall system performance that's available as people explore cloud RAN. Okay, now tell me a little bit more coming from layer two down to the physical layer, um, Pulse Zone, and then you also have a, a neural receiver that I think you all recently demonstrated at a show in DC. Yes, and we're very excited about both. So the Pulse Zone, we decided to give it a name for a number of reasons. We trademarked Pulse Zone a couple of years ago, and we're bringing that term to market because, in fact, the OTFS waveform is the mother waveform. It is all waveforms. It's the mathematical generalization, if you will, of all of the three GPP waveforms to date. And in fact, it will fully comply with whatever 6G decides in 3GPP. Okay, so it can do TDMA in one extreme, it can do FDMA in another extreme, it can do all of the other waveforms uh, that we've done in history on, on that mother waveform. It's a pulse, 
when it's trying to address delay, it's a tone when it's trying to address Doppler, and at the, at the center, if you will, it has both the attributes of both a pulse and a tone. And the reason those are important is pulses generally map to sensing and radar-based solutions, and tones generally map to communication-based solutions. And when people are now driving the killer app in 6G is ISAC, we'll see if that in fact pans out. I, I do believe that's probably the platform play for both the defense sectors, which want it urgently, and the cellular environment that's rapidly evolving in that direction. When people want integrated sensing and communication, you'll want integrated pulses and tones. And instead of bolting them together, we do both functions in every single resource. We can't stop sensing because we communicate by going through sensing. We first map the environment and then we use that information to communicate. So we are both a radar technology and a communication technology in one. And so that's going to give us a huge advantage as the debate continues in the 3GPP environment. Well, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about integrated sensing and communication. You use the word platform, which I think is an apt descriptor here. But essentially what we're talking about is using this distributed radio access network infrastructure to also sense the environment around it. Yes. Defense, natural use case there, but there's lots of other opportunities. How do you see this shaping up and how do you see Cohere playing in the space going forward? Well, I think very soon we'll realize that every antenna is a sensor. And once every cellular antenna is a sensor, there's going to be millions and millions of sensors out there. They're going to play extremely important roles in public safety. At the terrestrial level, they're going to play extremely important roles in defense at both terrestrial and uh, non-terrestrial network level. Sensing is going to help consumers localize uh, themselves, their objects, their families. Very much like Find My iPhone, you're going to have Find My Everything. You're going to know every single thing around you. You're going to map the physical environment. In fact, our USM actually creates a digital twin of the physical world, which is how it then directs energy, it steers energy, and replicates beams in space. So it's a spatial multiplexer. Right, so, so once we've mapped that, we've created a digital twin of the physical world. Another term people will probably start using, we'll be using ourselves as well, is we're going to tokenize channel state information. That tends to be the vernacular of the AI world when they tokenize functions. Uh, that uh, drive workloads in the cloud. We're going to tokenize the fundamental building block of network performance, which is channel state information. So we see that as a platform. Once you have that as a platform, if you have eight antennas, you have the opportunity to put eight beams out, if you, four beams out. It depends on if they're physical antennas or polarization schemes. So as, as you go from 4TR to 8TR to 16 and 32 and 64, and frankly even more, there's some spatial plays out there in the satellite world that have thousands of antenna elements on their, on their um, arrays. We're going to be able to scale up to massive, massive MIMO and uh, intelligently schedule users as long as we can keep them separated or, if you will, isolated in space. And then I, I do want to circle back to something you referenced there. Uh, the standardization work within 3GPP on 6G began earlier this year, mm -hmm. but it sounds to me like you're, you're already doing what that will become, right? Correct. Yeah, so the, uh, what I've seen, in, well, I've been in the wireless industry since 86. So it's coming up on 40 years now. Uh, what I've seen is 3GPP does a lot of great work, but some of the most profound innovations happened outside 3GPP and got delivered into 3GPP in a late stage of the revolution. If you think like CDMA, Qualcomm pioneered CDMA and then brought it as a near complete spec with its partners to the standards bodies. A lot of people forget that. And then the standards bodies evolved CDMA into WCDMA and all of the various versions around the world. I was happy to be the co-founder and CEO of a company called Flareon Technologies and we pioneered OFDM outside the standards bodies. We built an entire system and we delivered that through the acquisition that Qualcomm made of our company into the standards body as a near complete spec. Right, so we respect the role of 3GPP and we'll play within 3GPP, but we are 100% committed to productizing OTFS and delivering that to the industry as a benefit to the industry. If for any reason 3GPP doesn't adopt that, here's what's really wonderful, Sean. So I talked about OTFS being the mathematical generalization, if you will, of all 3GPP waveforms. We can already create a 4G waveform with an OTFS base station. We can attach a 5G uh, handset with over a 5G waveform. Whatever comes out of 3GPP on 6G, we'll render that with an o OTFS technology. So what we'll have is we'll have an elastic, if you will, or a programmable layer one platform, and we'll have an elastic programmable layer two platform that scales from 4TR to, to max 
uh, if you will, a massive MIMO. And it'll also go from FTD to TDD. It'll work on any spectrum. It'll work on any silicon. It'll work on the edge, and it'll work in the cloud. This is what Open RAM was all about. It was innovation. It wasn't just opening interfaces so you could beat down vendor A against vendor B and then do it over here on a different network element and then put the pieces back together again and get the same performance. In my opinion, that's of some value, but when you're done beating down this supply chain, you're going to find out that there's not much money in this supply chain to start with. So if you beat them down, you're just going to drive consolidation of the winning vendors and the losing vendors. What the industry really needs is massive innovation and driving to cloud economics because some of the most profitable service providers in the entire world, ironically, are the cloud service providers. Wh who everyone thought, I'm never going to go cloud, that's commoditization, but the sheer scale of their businesses and the sheer software margins of those businesses are making them the, most, the largest and most profitable players in the entire communication space. So it's time to bring that cloud ran set of economics and architecture into wireless. If you think about it, the, the capacity of the core Internet is massive, it's almost unmeasurable, it's, it's so big. The interconnection between data centers are all fiber, massive backhauls. The connectivity to the base station is going toward fiber, and then you get this radio link that's always been and probably always will be the bottleneck to user performance. It's time to take that, that bottleneck and rapid, massively expand it, and the only way you can do that is bring the scheduler back into the network and drive, and drive uh, virtualization across across the network. Another topic I wanted to hear from you on, Ray, is uh, the outlook for non-terrestrial networks. I, I think, you know, we're in the early days here and it's all about sort of coverage expansion, emergency texting, but the services are evolving rapidly. The business environment's evolving rapidly. And when we think about 6G, the idea here is a sort of seamless integration of NTN, TN. Where do you see Cohere playing in the space? Yeah, we've got a great role in that space. Uh, so, uh, and, and it is early innings of maybe a double header, the second game, because remember, these satellite networks have been up there for a long time. Uh, not necessarily the exact same satellites, some of them decommissioned and they're in Gen 2 or they're in Gen 3, but non-terrestrial networks have been around a long time, but at the renaissance that has happened in like the last two or three years has been the sheer scale of SpaceX um, and their ability to launch massive numbers of satellites. Um, and the recent announcements that people have done to direct to phone, especially Apple driving that with, uh, with Global Star and a number of other companies. So we're in what I would call the renaissance period, if you will, of a long journey of NTNs. They're very far away from the Earth in their orbit, so they've got a long delay. And, and as you try to network them, there's a, not only a long delay, but a large delay spread. And then they're traveling across the sky, in most cases 20 plus thousand miles an hour. So you've got massive Doppler implications and Doppler spread. So you think about Cohere having taken the world from time frequency to delay Doppler. We've evolved from where those issues are impairments to where those issues are the normal way we measure things, right? So we will have a very strategic role in addressing the delay and Doppler impairments that are currently challenging NTNs that are limiting them to maybe text messages or SOS symbols. We'll be bringing broadband profitably to those NTNs. I still believe terrestrial networks are going to be by far the highest capacity. So they'll be sort of, when you look at your usage charts, you'll say I did most of my usage on Wi-Fi connected to fixed broadband. I did a significant share of my usage while I was moving. And of that, I did about 10% of it to 20% of it while uh, attached to a satellite because it filled in the holes as I moved around the Earth. All right, so I think satellites are going to play a big role. I don't believe they're going to displace terrestrial networks, but I think they're going to augment it much the same way as your, the cellular networks augment Wi-Fi. Right? Because as it turns out, the cellular networks only handle 16% um, on average of any user's usage. The other 84% is done on some Wi-Fi attached to broadband that you've either already paid for at home or you're sort of paying for at a hotel or a, or a lobby like this. So let's bring this all together, Ray. You, you referenced uh, you know, the point of Open RAN and the emphasis for so long has been on the plumbing, on the interfaces and making sure that these multi-vendor systems can work. I think we're past that. So now the point is programmability, it's innovation. At the same time, we're trying to bring cloud economics to bear on the radio access network. And then we've got this idea of AI RAN really coming to the fore. Yes. So what does all this mean going forward for our industry and for Cohere? Well, I think it means uh, return to greater profitability for the supply chain to the extent they leverage those innovations and drive those innovations. 
I also think it's going to welcome some new entrants into the category. Um, last week, for example, we were at GTC in DC where we showcased, uh, as you mentioned earlier, and I didn't answer your question on the neural receiver, so I'll do that as part of this discussion, Sean. Uh, we, d we showed our OTFS layer one solution on an NVIDIA uh, development platform. Uh, we've opened up a partnership with NVIDIA. Up until now, we've been mostly using the Intel FlexRAN uh, layer one and their CPU architecture on a Dell server. So as we port to an NVIDIA process, and they just announced a significant relationship with Nokia, it included an investment, but more importantly, it, com it, it included a commitment to drive cloud RAN and AI RAN and innovation. Right? So a lot of people are focusing on the headline, billion dollars into Nokia, and talking about like why that happened. Uh, I don't believe that's the main news. The main news is NVIDIA is entering this category and is going to drive AI and scalability of Cloud RAN. And so companies like Cohere are going to leverage that because we now have a very well capitalized company and a very significant part of the RAN supply chain in Nokia committed to that architecture. So I think that's going to accelerate it. Um, I think that's also going to accelerate the integration of NTNs because at least in one case, in Nokia's case, they're a significant contributor to um, one of the largest satellite networks that's emerging right now. So that's how I see this coming. And I, and I think everyone that goes in that direction may experience some short-term hiccups, but long-term, it's going to be a path to massive increases in profitability. And people that lead that charge are going to basically end up leading the industry probably three, four years from now. Well, it's a really exciting time for the industry. It seems like we're at sort of an interesting inflection point where it's it's only up from here and the work that you and your colleagues at Cohere are doing is really interesting. So I appreciate you taking some time to catch me and our audience. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Sean. I appreciate you saying that. I'm really, really proud of this team. We're a small team relative to the size of some of these big brand players, but I think we're punching way above our weight. And I think we're doing a great service to the industry. I'm really proud, especially as I come up on 40 years in wireless, of being able to look back, having tuned analog radios for the beginning of my career, and now sort of towards the end of my career, driving the 6G discussion into something that will lead to sustained profitability for everyone in this industry. The operators, the supply chain, bringing new players in that are well capitalized like cloud players or large silicon players, but also the consumer is going to benefit from this. When the consumer realizes, so in 4G, what the consumer got looking back on it was a native pipe that accessed the internet as they already knew it. Not some new internet, not some mobile internet, but the internet as, it, as they knew it was put in the palm of their hands by a computer company, not a phone company. Now it was called a phone to make you happy, but it's a computer. And a computer was put in your hand and it was attached to GPS so it knew where it was. And that platform spawned the Ubers of the world that said internet access plus location awareness equals value add. In 6G, we're going to put even faster internet access, which is not going to be a big deal, but it's going to be, it's going to be marginally important. Lower latency, which is not going to be a critical deal, but in some use cases, it will be an enabling deal. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move from location awareness to situational awareness. You're not going to just know where you are. You're going to know everything that's happening around you. And new Ubers of the world are going to come out. I don't know who those are, but they're going to be people that say like, look, if you want to know more about your day, what's around you? what's different from the last time you were here. Imagine that world. And so we're entering an, an era of ubiquitous internet access, even more ubiquitous because it's attached to NTNs. So ubiquity is getting better, speed's getting better, latency is getting better, but situational awareness is really what 6G is all about. Yeah, well, it's a, a compelling story. You all are doing a lot of great work at Cohere, and it's uh, really uh, great for me, great for our audience to get this conversation with you. I really appreciate it. It's great for us too. Thank you.